Good morning. Today we'll be doing Exodus 24. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you and praise you for your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. Right now. Cover me by the blood of the Lamb. Let nothing I say be of me, but let everything be of you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would teach us what you want us to know from chapter 24, that you would reveal to us your heart, your will, a deeper revelation of who you are. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would have an understanding of who Jesus is um, and that you would just reveal to us the mysteries of your word and the mysteries of your um, of who you are. I pray, Lord Jesus, your word says that if we seek you, we will find you. If we ask for wisdom, you will give us wisdom. So I do pray for wisdom right now. I pray that you would give me wisdom in the deeper revelation of your word. And I pray that for everybody listening to this video, that as they're listening, you would be filling them with the Holy Spirit, that you would be covering them by the blood of the Lamb, and that you would give each and every person the wisdom um, of you, and they could understand your word in a deeper way this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So before we start, you may have noticed a little character up here. It's called, um, he's called uh, Little Lamb. And Little Lamb is going to be the character in Deborah um, Delaney and I's new children's book that's going to be released in the next few weeks before Easter 2020. And the book will be called The Little Lamb and the Little Donkey. And it was inspired by the Exodus study that we've been doing from Exodus 13, which talks about a little lamb and a little donkey. Um, and the Holy Spirit just kind of inspired the story of this book to tell the Easter story um, in a beautifully illustrated way. Um, Deborah's doing an awesome job with the illustrations. And it's a new way of telling the Easter story from Little Lamb's perspective. And so for now, Little Lamb will be up there with the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Um, so be looking for that um, when it gets released in the next few weeks. All right. So now let's do Exodus 24. Now he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abadu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. So this is Jesus speaking to Moses, and he's telling him, come up to the, come up to the Lord, okay, to the, mountain, the top of the mountain, you and Aaron, and Aaron's two sons, Adab and Abadu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, <clears throat> and worship from afar. And so one of the things that he was saying is that the Lord told him, worship from afar, um, because at that time, um, they couldn't come near into the glory of God. And so one of the things the pastor um, said is saying, thank you, Jesus, that we live in the New Testament, because when he died on the cross, that veil was torn from top to bottom and um, allowing us now to come boldly into the throne of grace. We're invited to come in as close as we can because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But here they had to worship from afar. And then one little life application, he said, sometimes when we go into worship services at church, we feel like we are far off, even though logically we know that we're allowed to come boldly into the throne of grace because we've been covered by the blood of the lamb and we're able to come in boldly. But something in us is holding us afar from the Lord. Um, and he said, sometimes when we walk into church, that's how we feel. We feel like we're just not present. We're, we're feeling far off. And he said, you know, that's okay. He said, you still come to worship because worship is not about how we feel. We're not always going to feel like we want to draw close. We're not always going to um, feel like we're presently there. He said, but you, you don't base your worship on how you feel because that can get you in trouble. Feelings, you know, if worship is all about feelings... And I want to feel, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, in search of feelings. That's not why you go to worship. He said, you go to worship to worship the Lord for who he is. He said, so it's an act of obedience to go into worship. Even when we feel far off, you still go um, like they did. They had to, they, they were going to be kept far off, but they still went and worshiped the Lord because our worship is based on who he is, not how we feel. So that was just a little ba bit of um, life application. It says, And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all of the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. Now, 
the pastor said this wasn't a great statement for them to say because soon after, you know, that they end up failing. Because they said they, they made the statement more of like, um, yep, we'll do it. In our own power, we are we're gonna do it. Um, a better thing for them to say would be with God's mercy and help, we will we will do all the things that He's asking us to do, um, and giving the the honor to the to the Lord, not a can do attitude. I can do it. Um, I can be righteous. I can live. I can follow the law. Um, that was kind of their attitude, which they end up failing. He said it should have been like, Lord, help us, help us to do all the things that You're asking us to do. And Moses wrote all of the words of the Lord, and he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basins, then uh, basins on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. So here they're reiterating that can-do attitude. We can do it in our own strength. We're going to be obedient. And sometimes we'll feel like that too. Like we'll be like, um, I can do it. I'm going to give up this thing or I'm going to do um, this work for the Lord. And we're doing it in our own strength. And we're going to be, we're going to fail. Because anytime we try to do even the Lord's work in our own strength without relying on Him, we end up burning out and failing, tripped up by the enemy. Um, and that's happened to me multiple times. Um, you know, you don't know that you're doing it so much. You're thinking you're doing the right thing. But then if you haven't prayed about it, if you haven't asked to be covered and you go out and even doing God's work, the enemy is going to come in and know, I kind of like what I tell my preschoolers, the reason that we pray every morning to put our armor on is because that sneaky snake is going to come and bite us on the heel and try to make us trip. Um, so that's why you have to put your armor on. You have to be spiritually prepared. You put your boots of peace on to spread the gospel um, so that your feet are protected um, from that sneaky snake. So that's kind of what, um, why it wasn't a great statement for them here. Yep, we're going to do it. They should have said, Lord, help us do it. And that's how we should do. Put your armor on. Lord, help me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Come in by the blood of the Lamb. And then go out and do the work. Um, it says, Moses took half the blood and put it in the basins and took half the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Um, it said, then he took the book of the covenant, read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to these words. And so he said, the sprinkling, according to the pastor, he said, um, half of the blood spilt on the altar speaks of the cross and speaks of salvation. So he put the, the altar and the blood being on the altar speaks of Jesus dying on the cross and speaks of the cross being our means of salvation. The sprinkling of the blood on the people speaks of sancti sanctification, which means we're becoming more and more like Christ. We're being um, sanctified. We're being set apart. Um, so there's two parts to, to the first part is when you come to the cross, you first get saved. That's the blood of the cross. But then also the, the blood that's sprinkled on us um, throughout our life is sanctification. We're being set apart. And then how do you apply the blood daily or in our lives now? Through communion. When we do communion, we're continuing to be sanctified and, and being set apart. So that's why communion is so important. It says, um, verse 9, Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, um, and Abedu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Okay, so they saw the God of Israel. Now, the pastor really went into this for a long time because he really wanted to make a distinction. Who did they see? Because um, in the scripture, it says that nobody can see God um, and live. So in John 1, 18, it says, and 19, it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. Um, the only begotten son who is, a, who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So nobody has seen God, okay, God the father. Um, so that's um, John 1, 18. It says, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, 16, no man can approach him who man cannot see. Okay, in 1 John 4, 12, no man has seen God at any time. So if no man has seen God the father, then who are they seeing here? It says, and they saw the God of Israel. 
the, they said who they saw was Jesus, okay? The Jesus who appears in the Old Testament. Um, that's who they're seeing. And he says people who are in cults, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, other religions, they will tell you um, that this is not, that Jesus is not God. They will say that Jesus is not God. Um, but he said, Isaiah 6, 1 says of Isaiah, when we studied it, remember he said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. I'm not going to read Isaiah 1, but Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on the throne, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, um, which is God's holy name. And that God said to him, whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, send me. And so who Isaiah saw was Jesus. Because in John 12, um, let me read that. John 12. Okay. Oh, it's verse 41. Hold on. Okay, so verse, we'll start at verse 37 on John 12, 37. And although he had done, Jesus had so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he said, Lord, who has believed your, um, our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could, they could not believe because Isaiah again said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Least they shall see with their eyes, least they shall understand with their hearts and turn so that, I, so that I shall heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Um, and so right here, John is saying that who Isaiah saw in chapter six, because Isaiah six is being, um, six one is being quoted here. So John is quoting from Isaiah um, that who Isaiah saw was Jesus, okay? It says Isaiah saw his glory, Jesus' glory, and spoke of him, Jesus. So it's confirming that Jesus was who Isaiah saw, um, and that's the, the New Testament is confirming that, and that here, it's the same God, the God of Israel. So Jesus, and, he, and so the pastor really wanted to make this um, um, point very clear. Jesus is God, okay? Jesus is Yahweh. Um, it says the cults, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, they say that Jesus is not God. Um, so it says, so in Exodus 24, they saw Jesus. Every time in the Old Testament that they, it says they saw God, they saw Jesus. Uh, because later in Exodus, Moses asks God if you can see him. And he says, no, because you're not going to live. He said, but you can see my back. But it's not his literal back. It means the back of his glory. Um, and so he said, we can know that Jesus is God because the Bible says, that Jesus is the expressed image of God. It's the God we can see. Uh, because in Revelation, God is described as color, brilliance, a rainbow, um, in rainbow colors. And Jesus himself said, God is spirit. Um, and when we get to heaven, we will bask in God's Shekinah glory, just like they did in the temple. We're not going to see like an old man with a beard, God the Father sitting on a throne. Um, we will, we will sense his presence, but the person that we can relate to is God manifest in the flesh, um, Emmanuel, God with us. The person that we can relate to is Jesus because God chose to manifest himself um, in, in human form that way. Um, it says God is everywhere around us, um, but God reveals himself into the person of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit dwells in us and reveals himself to us that way. Um, it says, uh, Jesus made a point to, to say to people, he who has seen the son has seen the father. Um, and so the, the father and I are one. And so this is to, so he just really wanted to put this point. He said, because a lot of people get confused when they get like, you know, people come knocking at their door and they will deny like the Trinity or they'll deny that Jesus is God. And so he said, um, Jesus himself said he was God. Um, and that when he was the, um, uh, the direct expression of God, um, 
So anyway, this says, one of the questions he said his son asked him was, are Mormons saved? Because Mormons are very, very nice people. And I've had the same conversation with my daughter because they will tell you that they believe in Jesus. They believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Um, and so people will get confused and say, well, they then they believe what we believe. Because my daughter even told me, mom, they, they believe the same thing I believe. The problem is they don't recognize that Jesus is God. They believe he is the son of God but that and that he died on the cross but they believe he's a created being that the that god the father created him that he's the brother of michael the archangel and the brother of lucifer um and so it's very it's very um uh what are they like it's very important for us for ask people who do you say jesus is because if they deny that jesus is god in the flesh then they are not they don't believe the same way we do um, and they're not saved because it says, John said um, in, the, in his gospel, <clears throat> if you deny Jesus is God, you deny the Father. Okay? So if you deny Jesus is God, you deny the Father. Any religion who says that Jesus is a created being um, is denying that God himself did not sacrifice himself for us. It says Jesus is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And then the Apostle Paul said, God was, in Christ, God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. Okay? Because, and then one of the things the, the pastor just made a, a strong point of saying, because if you deny that it was, that Jesus is God in the flesh, then you're denying the fact that God himself loved us enough, that for God so loved the world, okay, that he gave his only son, you're denying the fact that God loved us enough to manifest himself as Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And that's denying God. Um, and it says that's why to be saved, you must confess that Jesus is God, okay? Um, and that he paid the price for our sins. So if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Lord, Yahweh. Okay, Romans 10, 9. Um, so anyways, just... I'm just kind of making that a strong point because the pastor made a point of making that a strong point, um, that that's the difference between a lot of the false religions that sound um, and confuse people into thinking they believe the same thing we do. But it all comes down to who they say Jesus is. If they deny Jesus is God, then they don't believe the same way and they're not saved because it's denying that God loved us enough to become Emmanuel, God with us, and then um, denying that he died on the cross for our sins because God manifested himself in the flesh and he reconciled us to himself. All right, so that's just reiterating that. Um, and so it says, Moses went up to also with Aaron, Nadab, and uh, Abadu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. So they saw Jesus. And there he was under his feet, as it were a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. And so they saw God, and they ate and drank with him. So this is really a picture of communion, um, because they ate and drank with Jesus. And so it's a representation of like a foreshadowing of them having communion here on the mountaintop with Jesus. And it says the nobles. Who is a noble? A noble is not like... Um, like we would think of nobles now as somebody high up in positions in the um, in royalty. No, it says that noble actually means rooted ones. So who is noble in God's economy? Those who are rooted and grounded in their faith and in the word and in the scripture. Because there's a scripture that says they are like a tree planted by the river of living water and they produce good fruit. So a noble in God's economy is somebody rooted in faith and in the word. Um, and so they were told... To come and have communion with him. It says, who, okay, so let me continue here. Um, and so they ate and, had, and drank with him. It was Jesus. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me, come up with me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. Okay, so Moses was told, come up here with me. Okay. On the mountain and be there and then i'm going to give you um, the tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which i've written that you may teach them so one of the things he says is who does the lord say who does the lord give his word to 
those who he knows will teach and share with others. So if, it, if you want the Lord to, reveal, to give you his word and to reveal it to you, be one who knows um, who he knows. So be one that he knows, Jesus knows, will teach and share it with others. So that was a good point to us. You know, the more we want to reveal the Lord to reveal to us his word, the more we have to teach and share with others. Um, and then one little life application, he said that he has circled in his Bible. It says, come up with, come, need, come up with me to the mountain and be there. So if we want the Lord to reveal to us his word um, and his heart and his purposes and everything, we have to be there. That means when we're called, when we go to church, when we're called in the presence of God, when we have our dev um, quiet time, when we have our devotions, be there up here <laughs> in mind, body, and spirit. Don't be distracted. Don't be, you know, be present and ready to receive. Okay. Um, so anyway, that was just a little live application said, he said, it says, so Moses arose with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back with you. Indeed, Aaron and Ur are with you. If any man has a difficult, let him go to them. Then Moses went up to the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Um, it says Moses took Joshua. Joshua is an Old Testament name for Jesus. So the Old Testament name for Jesus was Joshua. So it says, so Moses took, quote, Jesus with him to the mountain. And so one of the life, one of the, the things that kind of, um, to look at this is Moses took people to the edge of the promised land, because remember he wasn't allowed to go in. He was only able to take them to the edge. So Moses took people to the edge of the promised land, um, because Moses represents the law and the law will only lead you to Jesus, but it won't get you salvation. Okay. Remember when we studied the 10 commands and the law, the law was to show us how we've sinned and how we need a savior. Um, and it points us, the law points us to our need for Jesus. So Moses took people to the edge of the promised land, to the edge of salvation. Okay. But he not cross in same thing because Moses represents the law. Joshua was the one that actually led the people into the promised land because Joshua replaced Moses. And so Joshua, Jesus takes people into the promised land. So Jesus is the one who leads us into salvation, into the heaven, into the promised land. Um, so Jesus takes us to the promised land because it says, no, um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. So this is just kind of when you're reading this, you can kind of see a different layer to it too, um, that the, of why Joshua's in this story here. Uh, it says, and then Aaron and Ur were left in charge and as we know, as we're going to read in a few chapters, that this went really bad because this is when they didn't come back for 40 days. And then all of a sudden the people come to Aaron and go, where's Moses? He's left us all alone. You know, and so Aaron um, does that golden calf and he fails in a really bad way. Um, but it says in that story, we'll, re we'll read more in detail later, that Ur was also here with Moses in Exodus 24. But later when they do the golden calf, Ur, Ur is not mentioned. And so it says that Aaron failed, but Ur did not. So it's a choice that can be made, you know, that even though everybody around you is worshiping a golden calf, you can set yourself apart and not partake of that. And so that's why the pastor said, it's interesting that both these guys are mentioned in Exodus 24, um, but later when the sin of the golden calf is mentioned, Ur was not mentioned. Um, so that's just an interesting side note. Um, it says, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, now this is just kind of a cool foreshadowing of the rapture. Because it says, the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the, and the cloud covered it for six days. Okay, so in the scripture verse, six day, every day is like a thousand years. And every thousand years, it's like a day. It's kind of a time piece that the Lord has given us. He's given that as a time piece, okay? Um, so for so if every day is like a thousand years, this is 6,000 years. It's been 6,000 years when we reach the year 2000, okay? And we've kind of studied this before. 
how a lot of pastors and Bible teachers believe that something is coming because the 6,000 years ended in the year 2000. And remember we just studied with Pastor um, John um, about how it's, um, this, and when year 2000 started, it's at the dawn, um, at the breaking of the seventh day. Um, and so it's early in the year 2000. So a lot of people are very excited about the rapture happening soon because the six days is over. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud because where is Jesus going to be in the rapture? He's going to, he's not going to step down. He's going to call to us from the midst of the clouds. Okay. So he called to Moses from the midst of the clouds. Um, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. So Moses went in to the midst of the cloud and went up to the mountain. So Jesus is up here. He calls up to Moses from the midst of the clouds. Come up here, Moses. Je Moses is down here. And Moses goes up into the clouds to be with Jesus at the top of the mountain. So anyway, it's just very exciting because it's kind of foreshadowing of the prophecy of the rapture. Um, and being called up on the seventh day. Um, so anyways, that's pretty cool. So let's just pray. So dear Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for just um, that when we read um, your word, it gives us hope. Lord Jesus, it gives us hope of your unfailing love, of your mercy that's new every morning. It gives us um, an understanding, Lord, of just how um, wonderful you are. Thank you, Jesus, that you are God in the flesh, that when we see you, we see the Father. Um, because you you're, you said that when we see you, that we have seen the Father. Um, and so, Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for your love for us. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would cover us by the blood of the Lamb, that no weapon formed against us would prosper, that no pestilence or plague would come near our home. We pray a covering of the blood of the Lamb over our husbands, over our houses, over our children, Lord Jesus, um, even over our pets that we love. Lord Jesus, our little pets represented in our family, Lord Jesus, um, we ask that you would put a covering over them too. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would just guide and direct every single um, um, ways in our life, that you would guide and direct us to the jobs you want us to have, to the schools we're supposed to go to, to the relationships we're supposed to have. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would guide and direct our kids and that you would guide and direct us. Um, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And come, Lord Jesus, come. That's what I'm praying. All right. Love you guys. Bye.